great to be here. You could also summarize my career if I may introduce myself a little bit, because I didn't have a chance to meet many of you. With three simple words, first lawyer, then banker, now car salesman, exactly how you would design it. I think pretty predictable career. But uh, glad to be here. Started out, you know, with Mercedes 2002, financial services side, and then came over to the sales side and followed Steve at the end of last year. I think I got what is the dream job in the industry, no question about that. Uh, Mercedes the brand, but also during a time while we're in the middle of the biggest product offensive in our history. You know about all the cars that we brought last year. It's going to be a similar number this year. A lot of, you know, coupes and cab, you know, year of the dream car. And then, of course, year of the E-Class for us. Most important launch, and we're looking forward to bring the E-Class to the market real soon. I can't wait, you know, how quickly we can do that. And uh, we are pushing Germany to have it. I would love to have it yesterday, to have it as quickly as possible. And I think, you know, we'll, we'll probably be able to get it a little earlier than, than what we've said. Not 100%, not but we're pushing it. I want to make one disclaimer, half serious, half not serious, but there, there's a good half serious, and some of you who had a chance to, to talk to already know about that. Now, if you hear me speak, you realize English is not my first language. I've been known to make some mistakes and use the wrong words. For example, I had to talk to a team that had made a lot of small little errors, you know, moved to Atlanta, and I wanted to say to them, no more hiccups. I said, no more hickeys, because I thought hickeys is the short version of hiccups. <laughs> Change the dynamic slightly. English doesn't also make it easy for foreigners. Plural and singular makes a major difference. I'll give you an example. It's okay to say singular. We need to keep our eye on the ball. I've used plural in a town hall. You know, you need to keep your eyes, in, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, so, that's the funny side, but I also used once in a while the wrong word, you know, quite frankly on that one. If I do that when we talk, just give me the benefit of the doubt. He doesn't know any better, he doesn't know what he's saying, and please clarify, I, I, I would really appreciate that. <laughs> in class today, beautiful weather, beautiful drive. I know some of you already had the chance to be out. I had a chance to talk to a few of you. You know, feedback about the car was awesome so far, and we're looking forward to here. I'm looking forward to drive it actually with you tomorrow, and then hopefully some today as well, and we see where it goes. Now today, we don't want to, here in this session, talk about the E-Class much. That's coming afterwards with product walk around and everything for the second wave. First wave already did it. We want to talk about three trends that are coming, three future trends that are actually big that we see changing the automotive industry in the next 10 years, probably more than in the last 50 years. There's a lot going on. And we're not just talking about you know, new cars coming every year with the same technology, more efficient, better design, and so on. We've seen that. I think it's three trends that are much more actually <coughs> uh, yeah, impacting us. And the first is the generational shift. Millennials are replacing the baby boomers. I think you all know about that. We heard a lot about it. We'll be talking about that more in a few minutes. Second, we called it driving without drivers, autonomous car. And it's not just about you know the, the impact on all of us. If the car drives us at some point from the house to work, I think it goes far beyond. It will open up new business opportunities for many businesses. It will change existing businesses fundamentally. Like, you know, I don't know that you want to buy, uh, want to pay a million bucks for a cab driver license in New York anymore if this thing's coming, and so on. So big, big trend here. And uh, we, we are pretty, we're pretty proud where we are with Mercedes. There's a lot that our cars can already do. Uh, and they, they, they stop by itself. They follow the road by itself with this Tronic Plus and so on. We are far advanced in that area. So we'll be talking about this one because we feel we are right there at the edge where this is getting more and more out to be standard. And the third one, no surprise here, the road to zero emissions. Electric cars are coming more and more. Tesla is having tremendous success with their cars. We have you know, a lot in the pipeline here and uh, we're looking very much forward to what the next 10 years bring. What they for sure will bring, regardless what happens you know, in election and so on, is much stricter CO2 standards. 54.5 miles per gallon, 
that will actually come 2025. And if we are taking a look at that, starting 2022, we're taking a look at that for the automotive industry, that's nine years from now. For us with product cycles and everything historically, that is not that far out. Yeah? So we are pushing hard as a company and uh, we are driving that as much as we can. So we'll talking about this trend as well. And Bart and the colleagues here from MB Retina will talk about the later two. And I want to switch right now into the generational shift. You see here, nothing new really surprising from kind of like silence, you know, boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, all the generations with the definitions. And uh, as Donna said, by the way, we send you all the infographics, you have all the data. Baby boomers, kind of retiring, nothing new in that. Gen X in the middle, and you never hear about Gen X. And I'm kind of, you know, asked, you know, one of the other researchers, why don't we ever hear about Gen X? Why is this not a factor? It's actually my generation. And the answer from the researcher, it's a pretty serious answer that one came back, because it's a boring generation. They just go along with everybody, they don't change anything. They're pretty unexciting. Yeah? <laughs> For the researchers, what's exciting is the boomers, because that's an established set, and now the Gen Y or the millennials that are coming. They've been very exciting because they have been somewhat different. And I think there's a lot of things that came together where we might have called some trends early that turned out not to be true. That were easily explained if you see uh, the background and we'll come to that. But there is some things that makes them different. Now let's talk first about, just to establish it a little bit. Oops, let's go up here about some, some facts that you know, have nothing to do really with judgment, that just can't, just facts. Baby boomers, 29% of the workforce right now, coming down, more, more retiring. Millennials, already 34%, and they are increasing. Yeah? Pretty clear, we'll know it. 40%, interestingly, only 40% of the baby boomers feel free to spend. I think we know that, you know, retirement, have you saved enough, financial crisis, and so on. Of interestingly, the millennials, 54% are already there. Still, some, you know, have the issues with that coming out of college, some still go to college, but the other ones go over there. And please, you know, these are always averages. Oops. Let me go back. Yeah. These are always averages, and um, we always need to be careful with averages. By saying that is, Bill Gates and I on average have both $40 billion. Reality, he has 80, I have none. Yeah? So we, we need to be careful with average, with sometimes statistics. If the samples are getting too small, it's not always working out. Here, we also have millennials will inherit 30 billion in the next two decades. Lot of wealth going on. First time, I think, in the country ever that we have a significant wealth transfer didn't happen before, and they have, you know, purchasing power right now, discretionary spending, about 430 billion. As a group, as a collective group, lots and lots of purchasing uh, power. So what's, what's kind of special, you know, what makes it different? First factor, engagement with brand and loyalty. Just a few years ago, we heard the young kids are not loyal to anything. They jump around like that. Not quite true. 60% of millennials say they are loyal to brands that they currently purchased. Yeah. And we come to what makes them purchase certain brands, we'll come to that in a second, but they are ready you know, to commit to brands and be loyal. You know, in general, over all goods they buy, they do a good job there. What are they looking for? They're big on quality. Yeah? And quality according to their perception. You know? So it can be anything from a ripped je rip jeans, you know, that can be high quality, the same as a manufacturer's good. Quality, according to their perception, is a very important topic. Second one, bigger than the generations before is customer experience. When they buy something, they want to feel good about that to a way bigger degree than earlier generations. Very, very important to them. And the third one, we wrote here companies that give back. It's really social responsibility. Whether it has to do with sustainability, with the environment, or whether it has to do involvement with charity, social responsibilities is very, very important to the generation. 
And by the way, that's true independent of the age. So as well as around 20 years, you know, old people typically are very strong in that one, but that's also true for the older millennials. That is a permanent change, much stronger than the other ones seen as well. We believe that is actually good news for us to consider. Quality of the product, I think, you know, you would hopefully agree with me at Mercedes, we have a high quality product. With the introduction of the CLA, we also brought cars to the market there that affordable wise, you know, with the millenniums are actually within reach. Might not be able, by and large, there's always exceptions, you know, to go for an S class when you're kind of like in the 30s or 35s, but it might work for the CLA or the C class and other cars. The S class is aspirational of that age, and then, you know, you hopefully get it later on. Customer experience. We worked very, very hard and will continue to work on giving our customers the best customer experience that we can get. We believe having the best product lineup, and right now at Mercedes with all the new cars coming, you know, I, I think we're in a very, very good spot there. That's only one leg to stand on. The second leg that we need to stand on to be successful over market cycles in the long run is customer experience make it, you know, enjoyable to purchase a car. Yeah? Offer the customer the channel of choice. Doesn't mean everything should go digital. We have customers who want to go into the store, who want to test drive and feel and see everything. We have other customers who want to go on the web and learn everything about the car and then come to the store and get in and out as quickly as possible. It should not matter to Mercedes. We need to do what the customer wants and put the customer first. There is no one thing that we put out there and want to put every customer to the same cookie cut. It doesn't work that way. We need to solve the variety. And companies that give back, environmental, uh, you know, kind of sustainability is one focus about that. I think we're going to get there with our electric cars, but it's also on the social side. And I want to say quick two words that, that are the two major projects that, that we are doing with MBUSA for the last couple of years and will be promoting them more and more. The one is Laureus. Laureus is an organization of the cream of the crop of the sports people in the world. So you need to win the Olympics, more or less, to be included there. And they collect money and work with coaches across America. And the idea what they're doing in many cities in the US already is do afternoon programs in inner cities, sports programs for kids that have no other place to go. The idea is not to generate the next you know, group of medal winners at the Olympics. No, that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying you know, to, to do the following thing, keep kids off the street by giving them something to do that they enjoy, which is very often sports, using sports to teach them values like teamwork and discipline and kind of working together. And with all that, make sure that they stay in school and get an education. Because we all know what happens if you don't have an education, then the chances that you are successful, that you have a successful career, are pretty slim. It's not 100% out of the question, but if you don't have an ed education, it's not a good start. The second, you know, um, charity, if you want to call so, the charitable cause we're working for is a relatively new one, and uh, we start saying more, more about that. That is uh, the Johnny Mac Foundation that was founded by officers from West Point, Steve Cannon, my predecessor being one, and the mission of that one is give a college education to the kids of fallen soldiers in, in some of the wars. Same logic there, you know, if, if the parents are gone, kids wouldn't be able to go to college, and education is important, so we're working closely with Johnny Mac to kind of do that. Now, to come back to the millennials, back to two attitudes towards car buying. In 2012, one magazine ran a story, why don't young Americans buy cars anymore? Back then it was, they don't get the driver's license, they all live in inner cities, they're moving back home with mom and pop, they're not gonna buy cars, what does this mean for the car industry? And Eric will be talking about that you know, in, in, in a little bit more detail, but basically what has happened, because of the financial crisis, because of the difficulties to get job, that generation, and we have here the new life trajectories, yeah, that generation postponed a few things. And you know, if in, on Facebook kind of gets complicated, I think that's more true about the new generation. 
If you go to kind of traditional, you live with your parents, you get an education, you study a career, you get married, you know, get a home, have children, children leave home. That's pretty much true for my generation. You know, that's pretty much true for me. You know, live with my parents. Oops. I lived with my parents, went to school, moved out, started a career, got married, you know. Nothing on, on, on that thing that is really kind of not no, or, or easy, kind of predictable. Way more complicated now, and we tried to summarize it. You know, it's live with your parents, get an education, move in with friends, roommates, move back home again, you know, after college, trying to find a job, travel abroad, study career, you know, this one year. If I would have told my parents I need a year to find myself, that would not have gone over. <laughs> and you know, I needed money, so it was just how do I get a job and get money? Different environment right now. I think you all know what we're talking about. Buy a home, go back to education and so on. It's just different environment right now for many reasons. That plus the fact after the financial crisis, college, you know, get more and more expensive. People just postpone buying a car very often to the same extent that they postpone getting married. Everything happens a little later. Now saying that, here's the proof of that. Right now, millennials make up 50% of the car purchases in the country. And if you go back, compared from 2010 to 2014, the, purchase, the car purchases of millennials are up by 150%. They are buying cars right now. And they still live in suburbia, you know, in the areas, and I don't know, you know, about all the home cities that are you from, but uh, in New York, if you live in Manhattan, public transportation is, is wonderful. You can use it a little bit here and there in many other cities, but I lived in Detroit for the longest time, and I lived in Atlanta. In Atlanta, it works to get to the airport. Other than that, public transportation is not really there. And in Detroit, it's not there either. In many cities, it's the same thing. We have cities, we have a culture here that's built on mobility with the whole suburban movement and you need a car for that. Now, some parts of the country like this here, you could use a bicycle, but then you better live really close. So car buying is there. And then the other interesting thing is, we had all these this discussions about, will they own a car, car sharing and so on. Well, the latest questionnaires and the answers we get on this one is, the vast majority of millennials is preferring to own a car for them. Just for them, they don't want to share it, they want to have it available. It's an asset that they want to have available. Now if you go somewhere, if you travel, you might use you know, car to go in Washington or Uber and so on. You know, very open to that, but for the private use at the main home, going into owning a car. So millennials coming more and more you know, into the I want to call it almost traditional cycle, you know, that, that we see here just a little bit later, which we believe is a factor of the overall environment of things that are changing, as well as of the economic crisis which just came out of it. Thank you.